time to get to the highlight of our evening. Uh, our guest speaker is Don Simpson. I think probably the best way to describe Don is a, a master of curiosity. Uh, after talking to him, I mean, it just seems like he's interested in a lot of different things. And when something grabs his attention, he digs into it, uh, gets down to the nuts and bolts until he masters it, then takes it a step further by teaching it to other people. He favors wildlife and nature photography, but he's done a lot of experimental work with uh, hybrid photography, scanography, light box photography, even iPhone photography. Uh, he's worked with a professional photographer, uh, had a 50 year veteran that was, uh, that he worked for a number of months with him, I'm sure to help uh, refine his skills. And uh, he's developed and taught more than 40 courses at the uh, Sun City Photography uh, Club, and he's had many leadership positions with the Sun City Photography Club. So we feel very fortunate uh, that he's willing to share his experience and expertise with us. Um, he's a treasure trove of information and, he, and he's really good about sharing that. So uh, without any uh, further ado, let me uh, welcome Don uh, to his first of many uh, discussions with us. And uh, the, the, the platform is yours. Okay, so I can share my screen. You should be able to. Looks like we got it. Everything look copacetic, everybody can hear me all right. Well, thank you for inviting me, Mark. Uh, this is actually a topic that I've taught a few different times. My motivation for teaching it, one is I've always been a big fan of Jay Maisel, uh, now pretty much retired, but um, he's an interesting character. I'll tell a little bit more about him. But I was in a group uh, called the Eyes of Faith, and we were trying to figure out a way to solve some of the issues in the world where words get entangled and meanings get changed. And uh, we thought maybe we could do it with photography by presenting images. So then how do you present images that have a message in them? So I put this lecture together for that group initially a few years ago to uh, to help get some ideas. So hopefully you'll pick up a few ideas. This is not a technical discussion. It's about composition and telling stories. And he's kind of nicknamed that gesture. And I see a lot of people saying that now. So I'm gonna, probably about the first 15 minutes of this will be more around textual to set a base and then we'll get into photographs for the balance of the time. <clears throat> So you can read, but Ansel Adams said a good photo is just a matter of standing in the right spot. He just forgot to mention how long you might have to stand or sit there. I think it's a lot about composition for me is patience and a willingness to sit and observe behaviors and look when I can for some predictable behaviors uh, as opposed to a rapid fire shooter that goes out and shoots six or 700 photos every time they go out and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I found that I find more interesting things if I spend some time observing the scene. And Brisson also said that photography is shouting how you feel, which to me is at the center point of photography. If I don't feel anything, there's not much chance anybody else that's looking at my photography is gonna feel it either. So, I think those two things, patience and, and aiming for feeling and emotion in a photo is important. Obviously there's types of photography that isn't necessarily about feeling. But we were also using it in a group that I was a, a co-sponsor of, or am a co-sponsor founder of Art Attack. And we've been moving heavily into the fine art space. And we thought that this presentation really helped to center some of our thoughts on what is fine art. So, so how did I get started? Well, I grew up around Rochester, New York, the home of Eastman Kodak. We were a bedroom community and a lot of the people in our community worked there. So I've been surrounded by, by uh, photography since I was a very young child. I've uh, been around it a long, long time. I remember 
one day, specifically my mother, I was bugging her. She told me to get out of the house and go lay on top of a picnic table and see what I could imagine in the sky. And that became a game for me for a long time because I thought it was helping me to see, to looking for things, trying to see what others saw that was different than what I saw uh, that helped shape my vision for what's going on. And then I was lucky, I used to have a condo up in the Blue Ridge Mountains and they brought in a, a world renowned photographer, Robert Llewellyn. He's actually the state photographer for the state of Virginia. He specializes in um, trees and uh, translucent floral photography. So I got to spend about three days with him. And one of the exercises he did was, it was uh, eye opening for me. He decided he'd take us on a short field trip, about 150 yards from a trailhead. Each one of us had brought with us a little plastic canvas. And when we got to a spot a couple hundred yards in the wood, he asked us all to lay our canvases down, spread out, not get too close to each other. For the next 30 minutes, you're gonna lay on that canvas and look up into the woods. First with your eyes closed, hearing the sounds you typically don't because you're too busy walking and then opening your eyes and just being aware of all the things. It was an absolutely amazing experience for me because I heard things and saw things I never would have seen if I was just hiking that trail. It's taught me to slow down uh, and, and look around uh, and spend the time uh, where I can. Jay, I think he's now 89. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but he has he, he's an artist as well as a photographer, and he uh, has written seven books. I have two of them. Uh, I don't think he's still teaching, but he used to command $5,000 a student, limit of six students for five full days from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., training in his studio in Manhattan. Just just for information, pretty sharp businessman as well. He bought a six floor bank building, 35,000 square foot and turned it into everything, his residence and everything about teaching and, and displaying. He purchased that building for 102,000 and sold it recently for $55 million. So I think he's doing pretty well. Also the thing that intrigued me about him as often as I go to New York City um, most of his subjects are found in New York City, walking around. He doesn't go any place that he doesn't have a camera. His camera is not an expensive setup. Uh, he's shot with three different lenses, but he never carries more than one of them with him. Uh, I actually tried that style and it's pretty effective. Um, I kind of went towards uh, iPhone photography a lot. I teach about eight classes in that. And that's for me uh, in finding locations and then marking them uh, is pretty easy with the iPhone. And then I can come back with better equipment if it's necessary. He, he, uh, he likes to quote himself as I don't carry a lot of crap around with me because I think the less equipment you take, the more pictures you take. And that's true. If I'm fumbling around with a big bag of equipment, taking it on and off my back, I spend half my time just getting set up. Of course, we've all heard this, that one of the first things in Genesis is then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good. Ever since then, photographers have been complaining about bad light. Basically, he's, he says there's no such thing as bad light. There's spectacular light and difficult light. So I think we need to learn to work with the light we have. When I travel, I most often like to stay in bed and breakfasts where I can talk to the local people and find out potentially some sites that might be of interest. Invariably, when I arrive at my first breakfast, the host will say, you are in luck. We've been praying for you. And uh, we've got pure blue skies, um, the beautiful sunny day here. It should be wonderful. And th then I start shaking my head but there are things you can do in pure blue skies as well. Um, we need to remember the dark, the shadows, the drama and excitement comes there as well. Uh, of course, light can control color. 
but therefore the light can also destroy color. So learning how to block or reduce light is also important. But when we get into gesture here in a couple moments, um, light won't destroy gesture if it's truly gesture. And you'll see what that means. I really adjust what I shoot based on the light. I might have gone someplace for a waterfall or a beautiful sunset or something like that. But when I get there, I might find that that's not going to be possible under the current conditions. So I adjust. I've been known to go from, I'm going to do landscapes to macro in the same, at the same time. So color, just quickly, these are a couple of points he made. You know, it changes that it interacts with other colors because the light falling upon it and it changes as it becomes larger in size. So if you've ever had the experience of trying to pick out carpet samples or paint samples and bringing those little samples home and think you've nailed it and then they install it and it's different color in every room, different colors at different times of day. In fact, it rarely ever looks like what the sample was that you brought there. So gesture, basically each photo contains two elements for the most part. They contain form and they contain content. Form would be anything in the photograph that represents things like lines or shapes or colors or textures or space or composition. That's the form that all photographs have some of. The content on the other hand though is really the subject matter what you should interpret, what was the intended meeting, and what does it communicate? And that's, that's the gesture. So he also states that gesture incorporates narrative and it can convey all sorts of emotional and intellectual content. So light and color are all about form. They're important, but gesture has all the content and it also has form. So trying to get both of them in the photo is, is a little bit better. Other words people have tried to use for gesture is essence or characteristic, descriptive, revealing signature. But Jay really kind of came up with this. And now as I listen to other people speak, I almost exclusively hear gesture anymore. So I think it's he's coined a term um, and it, I decided to take a really deep dive into it beyond what his book did. Uh, to try to understand it and what it can do. So a lot of people, when they hear me talk about gesture photography, they think it's somebody waving to them. Not that that can't be a gesture, but there's a lot of things that have gesture that are not human beings. You can find them in chairs and tables and houses, cars. If you're willing to look for it and spend the time to see it, it's there. I do an exercise when I used to teach this in a full two hour class where I would just have in the corner a table and a chair and a small flashlight sitting on the table. At the balance of the lecture, I would ask people go find gesture. I can't believe how many people never picked up the flashlight, but you can, you can find it in a lot of things. A good friend of mine was once told by a lead judge in a large exhibition before they went out to judge. This is something I look for when I judge. Is the photograph in front of me a photograph of a pretty subject or is it a pretty photograph of a subject? I've kept that with me for quite a while uh, when I judge and stuff because I can find beautiful things and just take a snapshot of them or I can find ordinary things and make them beautiful. And I think that's, and that's actually where the fine art starts to come in. Some thoughts, uh, you have to learn to leave yourself open rather than anxiously searching. If you go out searching for something, you might find it, but you'll probably get anxious. I like to let the scenes unfold and see what it brings me. You've all heard Ernst Haas say that we don't take pictures, we're taken by pictures. This is kind of a good analogy, I thought, but finding light gesture and colors a little bit like trying to hold water in the palm of your hand. And if you squeeze it, if you're forcing things, all the water rushes out of your hand. 
But if you're willing to be patient, it's going to remain in that palm for a long time. So it's staying empty. It's, it's being a vessel empty that you can be filled with things that you love. I've learned this lesson the hard way. If you see something, shoot it now. Don't say I'm going to come back and after I do this over here because it's probably gone. I've missed probably more photos than I've got. And always remain true to yourself. I'm a very harsh critic of my own work. Uh, and I need to try to find ways to improve. And that's my curiosity that Mark mentioned. I will dig and dig and dig. I've taken tons of professional workshops all over the world. And I have probably invested in thousands of two to three hour videos trying to learn what I can. And when I find something I think is just a little different, then I generally prepare a lecture or a full-blown workshop to try to pass it on. You see, I'm not a competitor. I would rarely ever compete a photo. I may in this club, but I, that's not my passion. My passion is mentoring, teaching, lecturing. Um, uh, that's what I like to do. And that's where I put my time and energy. Learn new things. If they're valuable, pass them on. This is uh, kind of a thank you to Mark. I saw he put one of these and got third place at the last meeting. So I said, I tried flowers, but now I use all kinds of things and found some interesting uh, pictures. So this is just a bunch of buttons I dumped on a table. Natural Light took a picture of them. I said, I wonder what I could do. My techniques are a little bit different than what Mark does. And I didn't put any actions together, but I uh, found that when you show a before and an after, that's when the, the amazement really comes in because people have no idea what that started out as. So when I show them, I usually show them as a pair. And I call this implied gesture because gesture is an action. It's, it's something that's gonna happen in that photo that's gonna make it just a little bit different. So with, with one of the techniques I've, I've now developed, it comes to this. Uh, Mark is right, it's a very simple process, but, um, but because of the tools that I'm using, I can make a lot of fine tuning adjustments underneath. So it's not always the same. So I just find when you put them together, it's, it's pretty amazing to me and, and it's, it is pretty easy to do. Excuse me, but this was written for the eyes of faith. So I'm not gonna go real religious on you here, but I think when I go out to photograph, a lot of times I'm humming a tune, I'm thinking of a poem, and th something that helps put me in the mood for what, what I'm facing. So if God gave us eyes to see them and lips, which is our cameras to, that we might tell, you know, God, how great is he that he's made all things well. So I'm gonna do some categories now to just give you ideas in different settings. Not every picture in here is a gesture. I put some photographs in here to say, okay, this isn't really a gesture, it's a decent photograph. Um, and then can show you some things in that category that I do consider gesture just to, just to help set the stage. So we're gonna start out with all creatures, great and small. So one of my favorite animals to photograph are giraffes. Decent portrait of a giraffe, way too busy a background, uh, but it's contextually there. So there's no really gesture there. And, and I, I don't know if I reminded you, but in my classes, I don't just show my best photographs. I show what I need to show to get points across. So this is not a great photograph by any means. But if we add gesture, that photograph becomes something completely different. My observation of being out on a number of uh, trips to see these great animals is that they tend to bend down naturally. So when I saw the adult and the baby approaching from about 50 yards apart, I was pretty confident from my prior trips that something like this might happen. So I had all my settings right. I pre-focused my composition, everything I wanted walked into the scene, snap one shot, you got it. 
that that to me is a is a gesture and and it brings a feeling to you uh, many times when I show this photo you'll get the awe that that's that's what you drive for but then further you've got a family so you've got the mother the father or the cow and the bull you've got the calf and then the larger calf on the right hand side is the uh, is last year's uh, baby. If you were making a poster, for example, which we were doing on occasion in churches and stuff, you might put something like family on there. So if we use this photo to explain gesture, the first thing I generally do is to convert it to a black and white. I wanna take any distraction away by taking the color away like I said on a previous slide, just to see if the gesture is still there. Was it color that was creating the photo or was it a gesture? Is the impact or gesture still strong? I've made no attempt to make this a good black and white. All I did is move the saturation slider to the left because that's all you need to do. I actually think if I spent the time, this is a better photograph than the color one but it, it shows a point. The message is still there, even if the color's not. The other components to add impact are obviously the mat and the frame, and they should not overpower your photo. One of the things that the 40-year the professional that I worked with for about seven months um, did, almost everything was just a black frame, a white mat, and his photography was to this day still the best I've ever seen. So if you put something like that around it, that's, that's, that's what you're trying to keep their eyes inside of, and a gallery card. Now, some of you probably thought that was the mother, but that was actually the bull. So you've got whatever information you might put on a title card, that's all you've got when you're hanging in galleries. I've got a few marketing ideas that I've been sharing with my other group on ways to uh, separate yourself from everybody else. Um, if people are interested in that someday, that might be a good talk. But there are some things you can do to separate you from the, from the crowd. But that's what you got. So you need to think about those things. Don't get a frame that's gonna be gaudy and take away. Watch your matte colors and things. Um, you don't have to use white. I don't always. But this would be an example, I think, of gesture. I saw the and my patients. I saw three giraffes walking one after another up this slight incline. I stopped the car. I focused on the lead giraffe. And I simply did a quick no louder than that, just a little whistle. And the first giraffe stopped, the second giraffe ran into the first giraffe. And what you've got here, if you look at the, the two on the right, I have a three, a three-headed giraffe all looking at me. I have a, a single two-headed giraffe with eight legs because you can't really see where one starts and the other one stops. And then the other guy's like he came upon the scene like wow. That to me, there's a story in, in that photograph from, from say a portrait of the same kind of an animal. Was I lucky? Sure. Did I know that things like this happen? Yes, because I've seen it happen before, but I never had my camera ready because I wasn't anticipating. Or the young giraffe with its head up in the clouds. Not true gesture, maybe. This is a, uh, a female uh, black buck. Again, I think a decent portrait of that animal. These are not in a zoo. Or the start of what I saw a gesture coming as the baby nuzzled the mother. You kind of know what's going to come next. But those certainly show gesture something, there's a story there, there's an aha, 
Some people feel it, some people don't. This, uh, this, this is the scimitar, the horned oryx. And it was in the field actually uh, on a really, really hot day. I bet it was over hundred this particular day. And there was a pond across the pasture from, uh, from this animal. And I saw it starting to walk towards it. And I said, you know, I bet it's gonna, it's gonna do something to get a drink of water. The pond was half empty. I didn't know how, if the animal got in, I didn't know if they could get out. I didn't know what they were gonna do for sure. But as soon as they got there, they bent down like this and got their drink of water. And I thought, you know, with the story that goes with it, the, the gestures in the moment, they find their ways to get what they need. This is an interesting story here. Um, the one on the foreground was standing over a, a herd of about 30 females. And then about 50 yards away up on the ridge came this other one. And as he moved closer, the, uh, the foreground one started with the pounding, like a warning, like stay out. And then I wondered if they would uh, fight. So I focused on the foreground animal and waited. And this, there was, this was their first, I'll call it embrace. Just as a piece of information, just because I never knew this, this is considered one of the most dangerous uh, animals in all of the Egypt and Sudan. I'm like, like over lions and things like that. And they said, yep, if you think and look at the head of this, if they were standing straight up, a lion generally will come from the front and pounce. If they bend their head down slightly, those horns will put them on a skewer. It's one of the reasons they don't want you to get out of your car or out of any kind of a vehicle as you go through these little safaris because things that you think would be safe are not at all safe. These are real wild animals. This is the Southern white rhinos. Just an interesting picture. Looks like a mother and its baby. Actually, it's not. The mother abandoned that baby on birth. This other mother had lost a baby during birth and instantly adopted this young uh, rhino. And even though the mother's occasionally in the same pasture with them, she has nothing to do with that animal. Everything resides around the adopted mother. This is what they like to do in the sun. I just thought it was uh, some, there is actually some gesture there, just, just the position of the animal. I thought was very interesting. Just curious if how many how many uh, rhinos you see here. I I didn't think we would see something like this, but there's there's actually five rhinos there if you count the top knots on them. There's three over here and two over here. And I was surprised when looking up. What's a herd? Just thought me think of a herd of rhinos called. And they're called a crash, which I thought was kind of a funny term. This is a, a, a mother and child. Uh, it's an addicts from Egypt and Sudan. Uh, again, a togetherness. It, that this particular trip I was up there happened to be when a lot of the babies were just coming out. So it was interesting to be able to see and experience some of the way that uh, there's, there's some animals up there that they actually put all the babies in the middle of a ring and they, the adults all lay in a big circle and then the babies are in the middle. I just find it fascinating to watch every animal in each of the different groups and their behaviors and what they do, which has led to some some fun photography. I don't know how many people have seen this. This is actually not an easy photograph to do. It's, it's a baby bongo. 
the bongo is is uh, the largest uh, animal lives in woods primarily in uh, it's in the west uh, central Africa and they only come out at the deepest dusk right into dark and the babies don't generally come out of the woods and so that particular night I was allowed in the park for an extended period and this baby came out even though it looks like it was light that's just my exposure um, it I thought it was interesting and they have this roached back until they become an adult when the spine straightens out. But a really interesting animal and the, and the adults are a lot bigger. Certainly there's gesture in this photo. It's the emu from Australia. Uh, I've taken a lot of pictures, but I've never got the, the light shining in the eyes at this particular angle to get the color. I call the photo a bad hair day. Um, the only thing you got to be careful of with an animal like this is that with that beak, we were warned to watch our expensive cameras because they like to go for bright, shiny objects. And many a photographer has had the lens destroyed by the beak of this animal. Yet, if you put food in your hand and hold it out, they will pick that food off your hand. And you can't even feel them do it. These are the water bucks, the one on the left, nothing particularly interesting going on other than seeing some water bucks in, in context. Uh, but they have these round circles on their butts. The one on the right, obviously, is, is some, uh, I think there's three of them there nursing. Um, the round circles are there because they travel in tall grasses. And so it's a way for the young ones to look up and find a target that they can follow wherever they go. This is an interesting uh, photo of a Hartman mountain zebra. I used to raise horses and I noticed, I always noticed that if you had food that, that you kind of held out from them a little bit, that they would do this with their lips, which creates an interesting gesture just by the by, one of those ways you can set yourself from people is I took an entire field trip and made a hybrid photo video and it's hidden behind this picture so that I can take and put this picture on a business card, hang it on a wall, whatever. And my viewers can download a free app and all they have to do is hold their iPhone or Android to this picture and it'll immediately launch the two and a half minute video with full sound. And it's, it's really amazing. So that's one of the photos I chose to do that with. I'm not really sure what these animals are to be honest with you, but when I first saw it, it looked to me, it reminded me of a mirror. They like, looked almost like perfect mirror image. Once again, I said, I'd like to see what might happen. I just gave the low like that and they turned and they were still mirror image for me. So I thought, I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, movement. Sometimes I use this slide uh, as the end of a presentation, but you've got the water bucks on the left and the rhinos on the right. If we use people, for example, and maybe some non-traditional gestures, I was wandering around in the back streets of London one day, and off in the distance, I heard a tuba player, and I'm, I was a tuba player, with a little bit of a light orchestral music behind it. So I said, well, this is a weird place for music, but I wandered there and there's this guy sitting on a speaker, all dressed up like he's gonna be playing in a symphony someplace and he starts playing a song. And then all of a sudden to the beat, all this fire came dancing out of the top of his tuba. 
and I could see no visible signs unless it's inside this device, but he actually had music playing to where that gas was getting in and how he was firing this off because it was amazing. So I took a quick video with my iPhone, a couple snaps with my camera, and then I could put that together again in another hybrid video because it was very interesting and entertaining. Certainly gesture, I'll probably never see that again. My grandson and his sister, they asked me to come and take portraits. At that particular time, my grandson wanted nothing to do with taking pictures and nothing to do with sitting next to his sister. So this, but I've often found I've done a lot of portraiture and group portraits over my days here in Sun City. I do a lot of three and four generation photography around holidays and things. Sometimes it's the photos that aren't the ones you set up that are the most interesting photos. But his father just said, John, I don't know if pictures are blocking that or not, but um, on my screen they are. He, he's actually mad, but he looks like he's smiling. That's his gesture. He just doesn't like pictures taken of him. And then I heard the baby in a room and I asked if I could go see what she was up to. I got in there and the way the light was coming in through the, the blinds, I just kind of moved myself into a position and she suddenly lifted her head. All I had with me was an iPhone, a quick, you know, quick snap. There's certainly gesture in that photo. Over in Assisi, um, it, it really was as windy. This was not set up to make it look like it was windy. It was so windy, I could, this is an iPhone shot again. I could hardly hold the phone in my hand um, but it was fun. It was a fun, showed a fun time at Assisi over in Italy and the, the beautiful landscape and uh, the, the family having a lot of fun. Or my granddaughter coming back from trick or treat. And as soon as she got that sucker out, out came the prancing and the dimple. And that's where the gesture, in my opinion, is in this photo. Without it, it's a kid in a costume. Or when she was little, I just followed her mother in to a, a bedroom that was reasonably dark um, and snapped a couple of quick pictures to show some gesture. Uh, there's no color, it's all black and white, it's dark. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it does show the love between uh, a, a mother and their daughter. If I moved on to small animals, I'm gonna use birds. I was gonna to try to keep birds on a stick off of here, um, but I've got a couple. But, so you say each little flower, each little bird that sings, you know, they made, the, you made their glowing colors and made their tiny wings. So, so to avoid birds on a stick, I thought it was unusual in one of my bird blue, uh, bluebird houses. Typically you see them carrying material in, but I've not seen them taking material out. So I thought this was just an interesting picture to snap. Or a black neck still out in California. I loved the way the sun was set, was starting to set down and this bird was seeing its shadow in front of them. Gesture for sure. Here's the bird on the stick with the golden fronted uh, woodpecker. Um, but a nice, a nice portrait. This one I liked in particular because this particular day of my shoot, it was misting very lightly. I liked the way the bird crouched down and just the look on the face that you could see the drops of water on the feathers and I uh, just held back the shutter just a little bit and to, to elongate the drops. And I thought, I think it's kind of an interesting picture. It's a pyroluxia, uh, so I'm dragging the shutter. 
I was told at this particular ranch I was shooting at that you actually don't see the cactus wrens uh, as a pair often out in the open like this. And so they're basically both on guard. They're looking different ways. The fact that he told me, I didn't know, might have been a line of baloney, but I thought I would grab the picture because I personally had not seen it before. Or there's food down there on that branch. You just can't see it. And interesting the way one would guard while its mate was uh, actually eating and then they changed places. This, this bird is Woodhouse's scrub jay. I was actually displaying it on kind of a, a bird site and got yelped at because I called it a Western scrub jay, but I didn't realize that they actually split that group a while back. So technically this is a Woodhouse scrub jay. But again, I was looking for gesture. I noticed when they would land especially if they were anywhere near food, they would do these interesting little dances. And so being ready, I had everything framed up, focused and just waited. And when that bird landed there, that was the first thing it did. Added interest to the photo, yet you can still see what kind of bird it is. Or some black chinned hummingbirds, two, two females. There's a feeder not too far to the left of the photo, but I noticed quite often they would congregate about 18 inches away and there'd be these little duels as to who's gonna get in because I had taped off all the holes but one in the feeder. And so I came prepared and ready. I had focused previously on some birds that came in singles, so I knew about the flight path they were going to come in and just waited. Sure enough, in about five minutes, the pair showed up, one click done. Gesture. This is a sanderling out in California near the Golden Gate Bridge. And I was intrigued by these little birds because they're shorebirds. And when the shore recedes, they run quickly out. They hope to get a little crab or something and then run quickly back. So this is the bird that is running out to get something to eat. And being able to show just as simple as, as using a panning technique to get the uh, legs to be blurred, I think adds interest or gesture to a photo such as this or out in uh, California again, um, out on the coast uh, from in Sonoma County. It was really windy, cold day, wandering around, not much happening. Everybody was huddled in. And I walked up to the edge and looked down and I said, oh boy, this is like a brown pelican heliport or something, focused and wait, because I figured there'd be more coming sooner or later. And then this one, flew in. I think something like that adds gesture as well. If we get into the uh, flowers, this is a big uh, example of something I do. I, I'm big into scenography. Um, that's been fairly popular for me to teach because if you happen to have a color scanner at your house, a flatbed, you can do amazing photography. The resolution, I can blow this picture up big enough to put on a wall in my house and it'll still be at 300 DPI coming off of a scanner nine by 12. Um, the focus is unbelievable. The lighting and color reproduction is unreal. And so I call this balanced. So you have a tabletop, and how could this plant balance on one dead petal in the middle? That's the gesture. And that's because it's not balanced. It's laying down. I just made it look like it was balanced. Or another just fun, I call it smile. 
just a fun composition on the flatbed scanner. But the colors, the textures, the, the detail is amazing. This is over by the airport here in Austin, where there's a series of ponds and stuff. I was out there with the Nampa people doing a shoot. It was really windy that day. I think I had my 300 millimeter lens with me. And I was intrigued by these flowers. They're called common day flowers, but they typically aren't shaped quite this way. So I did the best I could from a fair distance away because as we know, wind, that's my behavior watch, wind ebbs and flows. And so if I could just focus, get my shutter speed where I need it to be, surely I'd get a picture. I love this picture, the gesture with the big ears, the eyes, the nose, the hands, it's all there. The whole face is right there. Uh, the colors are great. So it was a simple, you know, I don't know, five second slurry of shots and one of them came out perfect. Or here in Sun City, I was actually laying on my stomach out right at the edge of the woods, taking a picture of a plant that was next to this one and was just about to flip over to take a picture of this. And this blossom came from I don't know where and landed on this plant. And the first thing I could think of is like a night hat like they would wear back in the Scrooge days or something. And so I was, I was lucky, but I was patient. I could have taken a picture of one thing and quickly snapped this thing and got up and missed this photo completely. Looking at an orchid, just I'll call it kind of a close up. This is an iPhone shot. And then I put a macro lens on the iPhone and I was able to get a really nice photo of the detail and that's all done with an iPhone. Um, but certainly the gesture is there. Quite often, if I take pictures of orchids and things, I get the shot on the left and forget about the shot on the right, which is incredibly interesting. This shot took me eight hours to get. Um, it was growing in my son's uh, yard in, in Houston. But why did it take so long? No, I did not sit out there for eight hours. But initially, I wanted a shadow. I wanted some kind of gesture in this plant. And I just had to keep going out and checking to see when the sun was going to get just right to cast a shadow, which to me makes the photo. Without it, it falls into the classification of the picture of a pretty object. Again, this is on the scanography, but I can create scenes. I can tell stories on this device. So you've got two young roses, a teacher, a parent, whatever. You can, you can create incredibly complex things on the flatbed of a scanner, and I can reach it and touch it from here. There's no setup. If I see something interesting, I can bring it home from a walk, and in five minutes, I've got a high def, really well laid out photograph. These are simple, but that's just, since I was turning bowls and carving spoons for a while, I said, I wanna see how far I can push depth of field on a scanner. So I turned it upside down, put some flowers in with the spoon and call it a bowl full of flowers. But that's all done on one scan, pretty incredible. Now using, some additional things. So the purple headed mountain, the rivers, the sunset, the morning. This is at the uh, Noble Lighthouse in York, Maine. I used to live right across the bridge from this. And I heard there was gonna be a good sunrise. So I was going across the big 95 bridge into Maine when dark clouds rolled in and it looked like there was gonna be no sunset, so sunrise. But I said, well, it's only 20 minutes, I'm, I'm gonna go and see. So the, the sun was to rise at 6.30 in the morning. I set everything up, it's 10 below zero with strong breezes coming off the ocean. It was 
the end of January. So you can see the wreath on the red building that was still decorated for Christmas. 630 came, no light. 35, 40, 45. I was ready to cash it in, took my camera off the tripod, threw it in the car, went back to get it. And all of a sudden I saw a little glimmer of light over the lighthouse and said, hmm, maybe something's gonna happen. Put the camera back on, made sure I had one shot. I took 10 shots. I was doing expo exposure blending. I was not using HDR at that time. So I could time the light. I did not light the light in the lighthouse. That, that's timed on the rotation. And grabbed the shot and used nine of the photos uh, and, and, and did it all in Photoshop with some exposure, exposure blending techniques. This, to, to, to my date, remains my most favorite photograph I've ever taken. Not my best, but my favorite because of the story and what it took for me to get this because I thought I was gonna have frostbite before it was done. This was a few years ago, that particular night, we had a really bad hailstorm. This is in Sun City. It was, the picture was taken 10 foot from my front door, just down to the end of the block. What was interesting was this was probably about five o'clock at night and the skies were black, like the middle of the night. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go out and catch some of these lightning because it was lightning strikes all over. I got a few pictures with lightning, but what was interesting is all of a sudden the light popped on. To me, that was the gesture. I wished I could have had somebody sitting in a red coat or something out there, but I wasn't gonna ask that. But there's gesture. It, it could be an electric storm, but that added something that adds a point of interest in the photo. Or over in Baden-Baden in Germany. I actually looked at their Chamber of Commerce site trying to figure out what these jars were. And you know, I never saw a photo anything like this. They're mostly born taken from a different angle. So I asked my wife, Emily, to walk up underneath there to give a sense of scale. But the color on that particular day was absolutely amazing. Or in Paris, um, we, were, we were there and the, uh, the Parthenon that's in Paris is there. And I saw the sculpture and I saw the beautiful tulips. And I thought, how can I compose this shot for what, for, for, to make a message out of it? And so he was in a presentation style with his hand. So I made sure that he was presenting the Parthenon. But then in his left hand, he's holding obviously not, you know, a piece of parchment or something. But I was thinking, oh, that's an old timer iPhone. So he's presenting a speech to present it. So I was able to bring all the elements into the photo, including gesture that makes things just a bit more interesting. This was an interesting shot, obviously in Paris, we were waiting for a bus. And I saw this happen a few times while I was in Paris where couples on their wedding day would get all dressed up and I don't know if it's before the wedding or after the wedding, and go take pictures in different places around Paris. I was really intrigued by this couple. They were actually beautifully adorned. The, it had just finished a sprinkle, so the pavement was wet to give some sheen. We had all the uh, trails from the airplanes up in the sky, and they're taking selfies on his camera. He had a remote control. So I decided I'm just gonna walk over there and see if I can grab a shot, not including their full faces. And I couldn't have asked him if I could add permission because I don't speak French. But this is an iPhone shot that I snapped because I just waited and watched and observed what they were doing. I wished I did know who it was because I'd like to give them the photo. Typical shot at the Louvre with my granddaughter. 
nothing special. I mean, to people that have not seen something like this, there would be gesture there. This is out in Big Bend at the window. I call it rainbow sunrise at the window. I was sitting in the breakfast room, eating my breakfast, and I saw this incredible colors come up behind this scene. And I said to the waiter, is that a typical sunrise here? And he said, no, when atmospheric conditions are just right, sometimes this happens. Of course, I didn't know how long it was gonna last. My camera's clear across campus had my iPhone with me. So I ran out there, composed the shot and took it. And I really, I really, if you've been to, to, to this place, it's a beautiful place and you can hike out there quite a ways where there's a drop off. I haven't done that, but that's what I'm told. Or a really animated beggar in Germany. And he did a lot of funny things. Uh, while people were trying to bend over and put money in there. This, this uh, is up at Lake Louise. I happened to be there probably a week to two weeks before the ice had completely melted. So I thought the interest was uh, with the mountains and the glacier and all this coming down. A little bit to the left of this, I do have a picture. I just didn't put it in here. It said, dangerous, do not canoe in this area. I, I can't imagine who's out there canoeing anyways, but that's what it was. One of my favorite, I, I worked in Switzerland off and on over the course of a few years. And I like to go to Lucerne, specifically to the Chapel Bridge. It's an old, old wooden bridge. It's a very fast moving river, but it's always nicely adorned. And uh, one time when I was there, I could hear this ching chang, ching ching, ching chang. And I looked over and it, it was, uh, just lost the name of this religious group that was there about to go across the bridge that attack, it attaches two chapels on either end of the bridge. Um, Again, this is an, it's an iPhone shot, but I happen to get up uh, when I'm on river boats and things early in the morning and try to catch interesting scenes and atmosphere. And I found this walking on the top deck one day, and I thought it was very interesting with the leading, leading lines coming to the foggy island, but yet you could still see through the fog um, to show the color in the, in the houses and stuff. Not necessarily a good shot, but from a gesture perspective, I was up in a castle in Germany and there was the bend. And so I hang back from the group just to see what, uh, what was gonna happen. Nothing real interesting came across, but I was at least patient to wait for one of the long boats to come around the curve to add at least more interest to the photo. So not the best gesture shot, but the idea of gesture. This is with a real camera, but um, I was on that on the Mosul River at night. The river boat's moving. A beautiful, beautiful sunset, but not much but the side of a river bank to look at. So I walked up to the front of the ship and I saw this gravel yard coming up. And I said, I think this could be interesting. So I went back to the midship and pre-focused pre this particular area. And when we got there, it snapped. So that's, that's a handheld on a moving boat in pretty dark conditions. I was lucky enough to have a condo at the top of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And the first year that I lived there, I think for five weeks, I got up and took sunrise pictures. This is from my condo um, every day, completely different every day, amazing, amazing shots. Many times we were either in the fog or in the cloud, I should say, or above it. And it was pretty special. And when the sunrises were just right, they, we had some spectacular shots. 
up to Alaska. Quite often if I go on a trip, I find a pro photographer before I go that I can hang out with and have him take me to interesting places. And he took me into the village uh, to show me some of the totems and art. And I was intrigued by the texture and the colors. This was just on the side of an old barn. There's a story there, but I can't remember what it was. These were even more interesting. These totems were laying flat on the ground. And if you look, you know, you've got the moss growing out, the textures, the three common uh, views, but the different colors. I just found that this thing kind of spoke to me in an odd way. The gesture here in Venice, out walking the back alleys of Venice, armed with only my iPhone. Sometimes I don't like to lug my big equipment around, especially in the cities. But I got there and I saw these colors, I saw the textures, and I saw the laundry hanging out. I thought, well, that's interesting. What's that thing on the ground? It's a pair of purple underwear. So the gesture, if you had something large enough, you can actually see it quite well, is that they're hanging out the laundry, but one piece fell to the ground. Or the painted churches right here in Texas can do interesting things both inside and out. But the group I was leading, I've been there quite a few times leading groups of photographers. Um, they all wanna go inside to take the pictures, but I've taken all the pictures I wanna take inside. So it was a kind of a windy day. I said, I'm gonna go out there. We got beautiful light and I'm just gonna sit there and wait until both those flags are unfurled, which took actually quite a while. But that's, to me, that's the gesture in this photograph. This particular picture is in Trier in Germany. It's considered the most Roman city outside of Rome. These are the famous Roman ellipses. Nobody has quite figured out what, they obviously held something, that's why the holes, but nobody could quite figure out what, what they were used for. I happened to be there on Good Friday and the townspeople were getting ready to do a live reenactment of the, of the cross and they were doing this. I don't speak Italian either, but in my best way I could with sign language asked if I could possibly take a picture so the men moved the stuff off and let me take the picture. And I just thought, how ironic. The Romans put Jesus to death and I'm in the second most Roman city in the world celebrating the resurrection. I just thought it was an interesting set of facts. This, I quite often at the painted churches now wander around in the graveyards and I like the way all this stuff was gathering on this old cross. And once again, I don't, I've never done a sky replacement in my life. So I just hope that I get days when they're there. Um, but I just found the gesture in this being the fact that, that these lichens and whatever all these things are, how long that cross, stone cross has stood. I just found an interesting similarity between the base of the trees and the feet, and it made me instantly think of dinosaurs. Um, so I decided to just put it side by side. So this is basically the end, but um, it's just, I need, I need to stress that we need to spend the time to open our eyes so we can see uh, all of the beauty that's out there and the behaviors and try to put something inside a photo that is greater than just what I call uh, ro um, ro road by shootings or uh, happy snappies. You know, spend the time to do it the right way. So if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to share them. Well, Don, I just want to say thank you so much. You really gave us a lot to think about. 
as we're setting up for a picture, uh, how to add something that might make the picture far more memorable than uh, it would if we just did the, the grab shot. Um, are you still pursuing uh, photography actively or are you spending most of your time teaching these days? I haven't taken a picture since last June but most of that is related to a health situation. I described some of it, Mark, but now I'm in treatment. So with uh, kidney failure and diagnosis <clears throat> and a few things, it makes it a little harder. Mm -hmm. um, although I'm starting to pursue things more in and around my house. And I think I'm gonna be able to get out pretty soon, but I couldn't take a chance with COVID sure. because of my conditions. So, um, I shoot, I still research, I still watch lots of videos, I still write lots of blogs, I still write lots of instructional material, um, but I haven't shot as much as I used to. Well, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your images with us. Anybody else got some questions out there? It's really a simple subject. I wasn't sure whether it was the right level to bring to this group, but as I as I watch and listen to pros out there, you know, light's obviously very important, but I think uh, I think composition is becoming king out there, and so I typically teach a class to more novice photographers on seventeen different photo styles for composition, and that. Y17 was one day I didn't have anything better to do. So I started looking through a lot of photos I took, noting the type of compositional styles I was using, and I ended at 17. And then I teach this afterwards so that you do all the stuff you typically would do in compositional style, but then try to add that something different, something that's going to separate it from that. When I used to lead, I used to lead field trips. I, I think I gave to somebody in the club more than a hundred field trips in Texas that I had accumulated over time in case the meetup groups would be interested in any of them. But when I would go out, we would always carpool with four or five people to a car. And invariably what I would observe is the, uh, the thing where there'd be almost like tripod holes and one person would line up a shot. And as soon as they left, the next person would stick their tripod there. Then we'd get in the car. And on the way home, it took about a mile. They would say, so how many photos did everybody take today? And the first person will say, well, I took about 500. And the next one is, that's all? I took over 700. So I would just sit there and not say anything. At the end, they'd say, Don, how many did you take? And he said, you know, I'm really not in the business of counting photographs, but if I had to guess, maybe 75. Oh, you couldn't see anything? I said, well, let's wait until we get together and view our photos. We'll see if I saw anything. My photos didn't duplicate anybody else's in the group. And finally, they came up to the people that were in that particular carpool came up and said, I see what you mean, because I'm going to spend a lot of time around a photo. I'm gonna look high, I'm gonna look low, I'm gonna walk around, I'm gonna watch for scenes, I'm watching for behaviors with trees, plants, whatever it needs to be. And when I find something that's different, I don't need a picture of another tree or another tulip or something that's the same as a hundred of them I already have. So I'm always looking. And if, if anything else, what this book did for me was help me to open my eyes and spend time learning behaviors. The, the art of seeing. Yep, it's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Well, you said about an hour, Mark, so that's what I did. Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, I know I learned a lot from it too. So I really want to thank you again uh, for myself and for the club. We really appreciate uh, the effort that goes into it. And uh, like I said before, we look forward to hearing from you again. There's uh, it's quite a, a resume you have, and uh, I'm sure that uh, people will want to hear about some of your other uh, uh, 
experiences and uh, we'll see you in the future, I'm sure. I have a question. Sure. Is it, and if Don will uh, allow some questions. Sure. Um, we had a previous speaker who also taught photography and they recommended an exercise of uh, going out and they had created very simple, I think it was a broom and a bucket <laughs> with a face on it. And they suggested taking, uh, trying to use your camera, trying to get as familiar as you can with all the different settings so you can move beyond just pressing A for automatic. Um, uh, was it, I mean, changing the stops under, over, using the different modes. Have you, have you tried an exercise like that? Is that something you, and what would you, how would you approach it to get your, well, you buy a new camera or you, even if you have a, a camera you used a while, what, what do you do to get familiar with this, this new gadget? Well, for me, that's why I created 40 workshops that I, that I taught. <laughs> um, I, I'm a, for me, because my memory's not that good, when I take my workshops, I take extensive notes. And so that gives me a lot of material to which to lie out a process. My workshops are usually two hours a piece. I'm not selling. I've never, I don't, I don't charge people. Um, that's not what I'm about. I just like to help. The, the, uh, in my workshops, like this one's cut back from a two hour presentation because Mark said, you know, you got to kind of stay in the hour, hour and 15 minutes. So I, I take a lot of the stuff out. But if we were in a workshop environment, which is a little harder to do in this environment, um, you know, I would have something like a table, a chair and a flashlight or, or something else. I wouldn't say much about it. My teacher was a phenomenal photographer. And when I got more advanced with him, he would just give me a topic and I'd say, could you define it? And he said, no, that's your job. You define it. So I remember distinctly him saying, your subject for this week is hands. Hands. So I went out and I took lots of pictures of people doing things with their hands. And I brought him back for his review the next week and he sat stone silent, didn't say a word. And I was really uncomfortable. So I said to him, I think I did a pretty good job. I got lots of pictures of hands doing things. He said, Don, if you come back with crap like this, we're done. I, I said, really? I said, well, then you show me pictures of hands. When he showed me his pictures of hands, I then instantly understood I completely missed the assignment. So yes, when I teach workshops, we would usually have about a two hour literal lecture workshop with some things in the room, but then often we would go outside the room for those that wanted to stay back and I could mentor people as we're experiencing things. So in Sun City, we have a lot of things. We have waterfalls, we have everything. So I can take you out behind our studio and I can, uh, I can set you up in front of waterfalls and show you how you can interact uh, with, with the settings on your camera to get the milky look and all that kind of stuff. Or we could go to a little hiking through one of the trails or we could go and I, I'm big on sunset and sunrise photography. Well, we've got the perfect spot to do it over one of our ponds here with beautiful reflections that come off the, uh, come off the trees. And I know the month of the year that I wanna shoot there. And it's also the month of the year when typically right at sunset, the water goes like a mirror. It just flattens right out, the wind stops. So I would take people out or invite people. And I remember a shot I got, I call Super Bowl sunset. It was Super Bowl Sunday. I looked at the skies from the party I was at and said, oh my goodness, this is gonna be incredible. Called a few of my friends, now nah, we're at Super Bowl parties. I said, okay, the heck with you then. I'm gonna go by myself. Probably got the best picture, I've, maybe the best picture I've ever taken. And, um, I was very happy to show it to them at the next meeting so that they saw what they missed. And I was only gone for 30 minutes. I didn't hardly miss anything. So usually workshops include exercises with them. And um, I've taught some workshops over this, but it's really hard if you're going to start. You, I can't be at everybody's house to set stuff up. So I usually set a, a table, like when I did the uh, lecture for our group, with uh, scenography, 
I moved my scanner out to a table right in front of the camera and I could live shoot right in front so they could see how I set up the photo beside the scanner and then turn them over and mirror an image one piece at a time. How I was able to get the predictable color for the background and show them the, the entire way that we go about a process. So yeah, I do, but I'm, you know, you can take very simple things, a waste paper basket, a table and a light. And if you think about things, you can come up with some pretty interesting photographs. Yeah, so gesture, gesture is a lot more than just the settings on your camera is what you've convinced me. Well, it's, act, it's actually almost not settings no. on your camera. So, I mean, it, obviously, you know, we start out in these classes that I taught, we started out with the exposure triangle. Then we went in and said, okay, let's take a look at each element of the triangle. So separate workshops for how to deal with depth of field and focus, then go into four different ways to deal with movement in photos, how to deal with ISO and white balance and it, and then we got into portraiture and then lighting for portraiture and then got into how do you work with models and sunrises and sunsets and I broke out all this stuff. What I've been having fun with the last couple of years is more uh, the interesting things around what I call around the edges of photography, like the hybrid photography. Um, fascinating. And then I found out from the hybrid photography, I could also do some interesting things from a business card or a photo that tells a story from one photo. I could tell a two and a half minute story. And if I could put three pictures on a business card, I have three two and a half minutes. So it's an incredible advertising and marketing scheme. And it's free for your viewers. So I came up with a lot of marketing ideas of how we can market ourselves in galleries and things. Um, and that that's been pretty well received. The uh, so it's it's just a question of like I got into iPhones primarily because I live in Sun City. The vast majority of the elderly can't carry these big cameras around with them. They can't carry tripods with them. They they don't have the money to spend on expensive equipment. And so I was asked. And I fill these classes, I only let 12 students in, and I fill the classes within the same day it's advertised every single time because there's a waiting list, it's huge. But I've spent a lot of time finding out what I can do with an iPhone in special ways that I don't need to carry it around. So when I was hiking, I hiked in the mountains a lot in our places in the mountain, in two different places in the mountains. And I didn't want to carry this heavy equipment around and it's dangerous if you slipped and fell, any of that type of stuff. So a lot of times I would just take an iPhone with me. Many times I came away with a really nice photograph. Sometimes I came away with a nice place to come to with my big camera and set up on my own time. But you got to watch bears and you got to watch rattlesnakes because they have timber snakes. So you just got to be careful out there. Well, if there are no more questions, are there any comments or further announcements anybody needs to make? Okay, well, Don, once again, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a real treat and uh, definitely look forward to having you back. And I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. Our next meeting will be April 1st, and that will be uh, the April competition uh, deadline has already passed for entries. Uh, the theme is going to be open. Uh, the theme for May is going to be iconic Texas. So get out there and start thinking about those shots because uh, it's not a last minute thing. You're going to have to do a little planning probably. So um, if nobody else has anything to say, I wish you all a good evening and look forward to seeing you all again in a couple of weeks. Hey, thanks, Don. Thanks, Mark. You bet. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Thank Ed. you, Thank you Mark. Thanks, Don. You bet. Take care. <laughs>